Hello everybody, my name is Matt, and here we're going to be talking about quote-unquote cardiac seizures. So now we're going to go a little bit, before we can go into cardiac seizures, which aren't really seizures at all, we're going to go into what actually is a seizure. Seizure is basically a burst of uncontrolled electrical activity uh, between your neurons that temporarily causes abnormalities in your muscle tone, so you're shaking, twitching, stiffness, limpness, all that kind of stuff, your behavioral dis differences and sensations and states of awareness. You can see, you can kind of see this as like a, a brainstorm, uh, you're electrical activities going crazy off in your brain then that causes you to have seizure. Epilepsy like I said is the most commonly diagnosed and it's usually diagnosed before the age of 20 and it also starts being diagnosed after the age of 60 due to like strokes. Here you can see the different causes of seizures. I'm not going to go into all of them. Um, some of the ones I want to point out though is your glucose. So that's why we check a BGL on our patients. You get your hypo and hyperglycemia, um, any kind of meningitis, um, tumors, drug abuse, uh, or ETOH. So delirium tremens can cause this as well. A number one thing with delirium tremens, why we need to do a 12 lead on these, just a little side fact, is that it can cause hypo K and decrease the amount of magnesium inside your blood. So that can prolong your QT. Basically, any Anything that can interrupt the normal connections between your nerves, your neurons inside the brain can cause a seizure. So when I talk about cardiac seizures, I don't really mean seizures at all. These, these aren't seizures and sometimes people refer to them as death shakes. Basically what happens is that there's a sudden change in the cardiac rhythm, whether you get a third degree bradycardia or like torsades de pointes, which is very tachycardic and causes hypoperfusion to the brain, which leads to a syncopal episode. And when you have a syncopal episode, sometimes you can have some seizure-like activity. Here's some of the ones that we're going to go into. You got your hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. You you got your ARVC, you got your Brugada, and your long QT. Hokum is the most common type of genetically transmitted cardiomyopathies. Many primary care physicians now kind of require this when they do a pre-checkup on athletes. Hokum works by causing structural defects inside the myocytes, and this interferes with the conduction, which in turn causes the left ventricle and the septum to become asymmetric and hypertrophied which is why you get the hypertrophic part of the obstructive cardiomyopathy for hokum. These patients have really poor diastolic feeling, but their systolic is amazing, which is why they're athletes. Due to the poor diastolic feeling, uh, patients' hearts are often unable to keep up with any kind of physically demanding activities. This is an oxygen supply and demand issue. When a patient's straining themselves, such as like running to catch a bus or you know playing a sport, something like that, the oxygen demand inside the heart increases and the heart isn't really able to keep up with this. This ultimately leads to ischemia and eventually into a deadly arrhythmia. A lot of these patients will go into VTAC and degenerate into VFib. If you're lucky, well, let me say if they're actually really lucky, they'll spontaneously convert from VTAC back into a sinus rhythm. So what exactly do you look for on your 12 lead? The two things that you look for for hokum is high voltage and deep narrow QAs. These are going to be most common in lateral leads, so 1, AVL, V5, V6. Sometimes they can occur in 2-3 AVF in your inferior leads. So when I say deep, narrow QAs, I'm talking this right here. Deep, narrow QAs. So if you look at the dock in the box for this 12 lead, it is often interpreted as like a sinus rhythm with some LVH and an old lateral MI. Generally, LVH shouldn't be diagnosed in patients under 40 to 45 years old. And not saying that it's impossible, but it's very unlikely that this 14-year-old has experienced an MI. Like I said, you got your high voltage, right? You can see through precordial leads and your deep, narrow cues right here. So a key point I like to get across is function QAs need to be one third the size of the QRS complex. And you can see that some of these QAs in here can be about a third of the size of the QRS complex. But the key finding is that they must be at least one box wide. Dagger QAs can easily be one third of the QRS, like I said before. But you'll notice that they aren't wide enough to actually hit the criteria for infarction QAs. So now we'll go into a little bit of why you actually see the massive amount of voltage here. The hypertrophy inside the ventricles and the septum cause the high voltage when you see on the 12 lead. The QAs are sometimes, like I said, called dagger QAs because of how narrow they are. These QAs look sharp and ominous. They should kind of remind you of Michael Myers standing behind you with a knife. All right, now we're gonna be talking about ARVC. ARVC, a, after a study that they did in Northern Italy, is estimated that it's, it happens about in every one to 5,000 people and is responsible for 11% of the sudden cardiac arrest deaths in young adults and 22% of 
cardiac arrest in young athletes. This is an autosomal dominant trait and it affects mostly men in about three times the amount of when men per women and mostly occurs in Italian or Greek descent. This is the second most common cause of sudden cardiac arrest death in young people. First one is obviously one we just covered, hokum, and this leads up to about 20% of all sudden cardiac arrest deaths in patients less than 35 years old. So here are some signs on a 12 lead. First off, you got your epsilon wave. Epsilon wave is the most specific finding for this. It's seen in 30% of the patients. Here's a picture of it. Next, you got your T wave inversions in V1 through V3. This happens in 85% of your patients. Next, you got your prolonged S wave upstroke of, you don't have to know, that's a 55 bell seconds in V1, V3. This happens in 95% of the patients, along with the localized QRS winding in V1 to V3. And that's seen right here. And the last little part, you can also see some proximal episodes of VTAC. All right, here's a 12 lead on this patient. You can see the T wave inversions V1, V2, V3. You can see your epsilon wave up here, right there. You can notice it there and there and there, all in V1. And you can see that the curus is widening just a little bit. But when it comes to actually diagnosing this, we can't do this out in the field. Uh, there's some other criteria you need to have, so bring this to the attention of any kind of physician. But it's all about the history. Like I said, this is a genetic mutation. And because of this, you need to ask if other family members have died when they were younger, or if they've had relatives that's died of sudden cardiac arrest at a young age, middle age, whatever. And then ask if this patient's ever had episodes of chest pain or syncope. If you're if they're answering yes to all these, the likelihood that's ARVC is is pretty high. Next, we're going to be talking about Brugada syndrome. Now, if you ever want to get an electrophysiologist to go from a bland, boring person to like a four-year-old tweaking out on some sugar, you kind of just talk about Brugada syndrome with them. So what exactly is Brugada syndrome? Brugada syndrome occurs because of a mutation in the cardiac sodium channel gene. This, uh, this often is called as a sodium channelopathy which just basically means that it's a poison sodium channel. When you look at the picture at the bottom of the slide, you can see that there's three different types. One that is more sensitive for Brugada is gonna be the type one morphology. So forget about type two and type three. These are not as concerning as the type one. So what is actually interesting with Brugada is that the, is that the Brugada sign can come and go. Just because you have the Brugada sign, which is the coved ST segment elevation here, in V1 to V3 followed by negative T waves or T wave inversions. Just because you have this sign doesn't mean you actually have to have, you actually have the syndrome. A couple of things that can kind of unmask a Brugada sign is fever, ischemia, you got your sodium channel blockers, your calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, nitrates, cocaine, alcohol, hypokalemia, hypothermia. An example of this, is this was sent in to me a couple of years ago by someone and a patient had a fever and you can see here, I was diagnosed, they called it a STEMI, it's not a STEMI. It's got that coved morphology that you can see right here with the negative or T wave inversion here and here. So this is your type one right here and this is not a STEMI. To be diagnosed with Brugada syndrome, the Brugada sign must be associated with one of the following. There's about six criteria of this. The documented of V-fib or polymorphic V-tac, family history of sudden cardiac death at less than the age of 45 years old, cove type ECG, like I said, and other family members, syncope, nocturnal agonal respirations, inducibility of VT with programmed electrical stimulation. Those are the only ways to actually diagnose Brugada syndrome. But if you got a patient with this code morphology with the T wave inversions here, they have a Brugada sign, bring it to the ER physician's attention. So here we're gonna be talking about long QT. Long QT can be diagnosed on a 12 lead as a QTC over 500 milliseconds. So what is interesting is that in long QT can be caused by several different conditions. Genetic ones is long QT syndrome. Patients with long QT are prone to recurrent syncopal episodes secondary to torsades de pointes and to sudden cardiac arrest deaths secondary to, like I said, TDP, degenerating into ventricular fibrillation. And you can also get your drug induced. So you got your 1A, 1C, your class three antiarrhythmic drugs. Other drugs that can induce torsades include tricyclic antidepressants, antivirals, antifungals, and the Zofran that we don't think much of. So if you do a 12 lead on a patient and the patient's nauseous and you're thinking about giving some Zofran, just, just check out that QTC, but make sure it's not like 520 or something like that before you give it because then, then you'll get this little 
you'll get this rhythm right here and uh, it might not convert like it did over here. It might just continue. So when people look at this, they might think that this is, uh, well in this example because of the long QT and the RNT phenomenon, you get the torsades right here obviously but if you just had a normal if you didn't if you just had this going on on a strip an unconscious patient and you didn't get a 12 lead beforehand you can't diagnose it as torsade there's actually it's going to be a polymorphic VTAC so there is a difference between polymorphic VTAC and torsades torsades is actually a type of polymorphic VTAC and it's associated with a long QT like I said over 500 milliseconds you can get a you can only call a rhythm torsades if you have had a 12 lead prior showing a prolonged QT. On the other hand, polymorphic VTAC is most commonly caused by cardiac ischemia. So if you come across someone with polymorphic VTAC, try defibrillating them, and if that doesn't really work, consider giving some, some uh, magnesium, so you can give 2 grams uh, IV of magnesium over 2 to 3 minutes if you're seeing this on your patients and your cardiac arrest patients and you're not getting into that. So I'm gonna go into that in a little bit later. Another thing that can cause this is hypokalemia can prolong the QU interval, which can also predispose these patients to torsades. So you can see that right here. Here's a patient I had a couple weeks ago. You can see the T wave and that's this massive prominent U wave, prominent U wave. And look at that thing, it's huge. So this is a U wave, so this is the TU wave. It's gonna produce a long QU interval. In the end, this patient's potassium was 2.7 uh, when I got the report back. So it's extremely it's extremely low, so that's pretty concerning with this patient. But like I said, it also predisposes this patient to going into torsades. So here we're gonna talk a little bit about polymorphic VTAC, like I said. This is an approximately 50-year-old female in cardiac arrest. The crew defibrillated this uh, rhythm and got this 12 leads. This is the 12 lead that they got on the patient. So if you actually look at this, uh, the QTC ends up being around 460, 470. It's not over 500, so this is gonna be your example of a polymorphic VTAC and not your torsades. All right, just a little overview. These are all, these all can cause syncope and seizure-like symptoms, and as you can see, are extremely deadly. Now, do I really expect everyone to remember all these cardiac signs? Absolutely not. But I wanted to show you why you need to do a 12 lead on patients who have had seizures, especially the new diagnosis or if they're middle aged or it's a kid. Just remember that a 3 lead is not diagnostic, so you actually do need to do a whole 12 lead on these patients. It's only a few stickers, it's a couple box clicks, and it's a sentence or two in your narrative. Just remember that people can have epilepsy and develop a long QT or even have one of these lethal conditions. If you're super ECG savvy, you could catch one of these and save a life next time this happens. Now an inspirational quote from the great educator Almo 2, he says that syncope and sudden death are the same disease along the spectrum of how lucky you are. Now as with everything else in medicine, it all comes with baby steps. You guys have a good one and stay safe out there.